uh, we are able to see even one or two techniques you know you can take it up from your end and you can uh, let us know also sort of about it that i would be, be i would be very happy to do a presentation take some questions and then do a live demo of how the software works yes sir that would be fantastic sir thank you sir okay So I think uh, I'll start off and let the uh, team keep joining up rather than just, uh, um, you know, waiting for all of them to be there. Uh, good, good evening to all the participants who are here for the uh, workshop that has been uh, exclusively uh, focusing, um, you know, on the introduction to qualitative research. Today, I'm very fortunate to have with us Dr. Shulman Sir and uh, he's a wonderful person and he did not take much time also to um, you know go ahead and uh, give a nod for um, you know coming over and joining us up in this uh, on this particular evening now his full name is dr stuart w shulman he's the founder and ceo of Exceptor. um I, when, um, you know, was uh, looking for some of the softwares exclusively for the qualitative research, I remember it very well that two years ago, um, sir, uh, you know, I came across Discover Text and I was trying to lay my hands on it. And it is, an, again, an open source, which all of you can go ahead and have a look at it also, sir, after he gives us the brief introduction uh, about the software. Now, um, I'm, uh, you know, overwhelmed to see that such a person has joined us and I was fortunate enough uh, to understand him uh, through his uh, wide um, experience across the fields that he has come. And let me introduce uh, him to the entire gathering. Uh, he is interdisciplinary, I mean, he has very good interdisciplinary university teaching experience. Um, especially, he has uh, helped to build the environmental science and policy program at Drake University from 2000 to 2004 and held a teaching and research post jointly in the information science and graduate, um, I would say, the uh, School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh from 2004 to 2008. He has also led NSF funded teams in collaborative, um, you know, qualitative, quantitative survey, social media and mixed methods data analysis. So, you know, in that way, uh, you know, I'm very happy that he is with us to, to, uh, today and, uh, you know, helping us out um, in the appropriate way as to what exactly is um i would say the qualitative research apart from that he uh, holds a phd in american politics and worked um, collaboratively with federal agencies corporations and universities in us and other global countries also now i can see that he has that global uh, presence um, across the domain domains also and um, you know he is uh, again CEO and uh, the owner founder for Discover Text, and which uh, you know he is the right person to introduce more than me. Uh, apart from this, he has held a lot of workshops on research methods um, across again. I would say not only in academics, however, even in the industry also. So he was um, you know joined up uh, to train U.S. intelligence community, including the staff for their own uh, company and then uh, you know he was also uh, present for the game environment and later on he uh, built a variety of election related machine learning models for racial and political identity in twitter bios i mean i'm also um, uh, interested to understand this project of his maybe uh, some other time we should be able to invite him and uh, know more about it apart from that he has also worked with the school of information sciences at the university of pittsburgh uh, wherein he founded what we call it as qdap in the university center for social and urban research so personal in um, the same ucsur specialized program uh, evaluation and i would say 
um, even the survey implementation uh, at that particular uh, services for those things. Now, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, I could see that he supported 19 funded research projects. That something is awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was thinking that, yes, he is the right master for all of us to uh, make us understand, um, you know, what exactly is qualitative uh, research is all about through and uh, his own uh, software, which is there called as this. Romani? Romani? That's it, sir. Yeah, may I suggest that uh, at the conclusion, if somebody's interested, I'd be happy to share my CV. That's fine, okay. but perhaps people would uh, would rather get started on the. Yes, sir. I'm done. I, I now the oh, okay. thing is yours now. Thank you, sir. Very good. Well, thank you. It's a very generous introduction. I, I will say uh, one small correction: Discover Text is not open source, but it is free for academics. Okay. So if you decide it's something you want to use, okay. there is a place to sign up, and if you sign up with an. Uh, an email from an academic institution you can get it for free for a year and do quite a bit of work anyway okay. let me just tell you the story thank you for having me very generous let me tell you uh, the story of how a historian me a, a student of literature me uh, got involved in qualitative mixed quantitative and other types of research when it is really not what historians normally do. I'm much, I'm much more a historian than anything else, but now I run a software company. So the story is kind of important. And I think the reason I tell the story to students is because they probably building their own story right now. And maybe you'll see some things in my story that uh, line up with how you're thinking about your own career. So in the late 1980s, if you can believe it, a very long time ago, I wrote a senior honors thesis as an undergraduate at Boston University. It was about these two books. And in the two books, I found these parallel characters, four pairs of them, that had these properties of their, you know, a student of literature, but also a political science student, and I was very interested, like, for example, both books had very extremist uh, politicians who were, who were law enforcement officials. And there were other character archetypes that matched up. If I knew what coding was back then, I would have called what I did coding. But what I really did was just use colored pens to underline and write things in the margins of these books. And I read the books over and over again until it was obvious that these character archetypes existed. It was a very, it was a very successful uh, thesis and it helped me launch my career. As an undergrad in grad school, I wrote a thesis, a PhD thesis. So some of you are writing a PhD thesis. Mine was about these crumbly old newspapers that I would get from archives and from other uh, sources, the interlibrary loan. They'd come wrapped in very carefully in butcher paper to unwrap them carefully, handle them carefully, make photocopies. But a lot of what I did, and again, nobody had really taught me this method. This wasn't really what was taught to me as an undergrad. And this certainly is not what was taught to me in graduate school for methods. My, my political science PhD, the required methods were statistics, econometrics, and applied econometrics. And so I came out of graduate school having learned none of this. But I did have a professor I liked who was interested in history the way I was. And he encouraged me to spend time with these old newspapers. And again, like in my undergraduate thesis, you know, this is the roots of my qualitative methodology, is that I, um, I just sort of naturally put things into groups. And maybe that's a good first lesson for today, which is, that there's not really a right or a wrong way to do qualitative research. Uh, most of us who do a lot of it, we do it because we kind of hum have some natural feel for it. And um, what I would caution is don't, don't assume that there's some school of thought or some methodology out there, 
some branch of qualitative research that has all the answers for how you should do your work, if you're gonna do work like this. My main lesson is let the data speak to you. Uh, that's what qualitative research is. You immerse yourself in the data until you reach some sort of saturation point where you've seen enough. You know, the term saturation in qualitative research means if you see more examples of the same thing, you don't learn anything new. That's saturation. It's a really important point. So if you saturate yourself in any data source, whatever, newspapers, I do a lot of work with tweets, people are studying Instagram, there's all sorts of things you can study qualitatively now. Interviews, focus groups, whatever it is, that first step should usually be to immerse yourself in it and have things emerge from the data. Like So for example, one of my first peer review publications was about soil fertility which is one of the concepts that came up over and over again in these newspaper articles. What I was studying was how uh, the government was going to make a new law to, pa to lend money to farmers. Anyway, I, I used to be a farmer. Between an uh, English PhD program and a political science PhD program, I was a farmer. And that's part of the story because around 1999, when I was coming out of graduate school and I had a PhD, I was finding it very hard to find a job. And that's a, in the US at least, a cautionary tale that qualitative methods in my field were not very popular in terms of being hired. Nobody really cared about the Federal Farm Loan Act of 1916, although I had written 500 pages about it. Um, so I started doing some new work and it overlapped with my old work as a farmer because we had something here in the US called a rulemaking which is where they proposed new rules for what the word organic would mean in the whole country. And the government agency, the USDA, Department of Agriculture, gave me this zip disk uh, of public comments, about 20,000 public comments, which seem like the most astronomical amount of data. I look at that disk, 100 megabytes was a lot back then. Uh, and then we started getting grants from the government and holding workshops. And this is like uh, some of these agent, you know, high level agency officials getting together and talking about the problem of public comments. We called it e rule making. So it was how you made, how the government made rules and incorporated online public comments. And we were building software. The software I'm going to demo for you, the first ideas for it were developed at these meetings. Although at this point, I had no idea that I would ever be developing the software. I was just organizing the meetings and doing the research. So let me summarize really, this is probably in terms of uh, methodology, the most important slide. You know, at a high level, in my political science program, I was trained to be a positivist, to do everything at the far right of this spectrum of methods. You know, uh, if, if it wasn't measurable with numbers, it wasn't data, you know, to, to, to build the skills, to measure the kinds of error that certain types of quantitative research uh, produce. If you've been through a PhD program like mine, you know this right side pretty well. Personally, you know, I was very much at the other end. You know, as I said, I believe that most of what is unique to my work and my software is based on being a purist qualitative researcher, which isn't always obvious when you see some of the things that I do. Um, but being close to the data, being saturated, you know, uh, having an interpretation that makes sense, um, these are all things. And so what happened? in discover text in my methods is that I adopted the hybrid approach or the pluralist approach, which is in any particular research project, I think that um, there are roles for both ends of the spectrum. And in a world that is increasingly divided into people who are purists at whatever end of the spectrum they're at, 
I think being in the middle of being flexible and adaptive and using numbers where it makes sense and using letters and words and concepts, these all can be done together. And that I really appreciated, uh, Romani, that you highlighted the interdisciplinary nature of my my work. I, I was involved in programs where you know quantitative and qualitative people work side by side and often together in research groups as well. And uh, I believe that's a better way to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Another another thing that happened along the way is I read this great book, um, probably still relevant book to this day, by one of the founders of the movement to use computers in qualitative research, two of them, Fielding and Lee. And when I read this book, you can you can see a couple things. One, you can see how I read books. <laughs> Always have a yellow highlighter and red pen uh, to find the most relevant things. And that's also how I do qualitative research. And that's also the part of this book that I'm drawing your attention to, right? It, it tracks with that idea of saturation. You know, you have to set up some systematic procedure to reach saturation, and you'll know it when you get there. Um, and so I encourage you to have a look at this book. It's a great book. Other really good books, and this is more for people interested in kind of medium data, not, not focus groups and interviews, but I'm going to do a demo today with Twitter data. If you're interested in medium data, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tweets, even millions, then these books were really the, the ones that most shaped my thinking about 10 years ago when we were really uh, going from doing open source software, which we did in the beginning, to do a, a, a software company and a startup. Uh, the Jeff Jarvis book is great because it, it sort of highlights how Google builds tools and lets other people fill to have, to figure out you know, how to build value and use and out of them. So it's a real pro tool building book. And uh, the Weinberger book is great because it's all about, in the old days, everything had to be in the one right category. He uses the example of the Dewey Decimal System in the card catalogs of old library books. If you've ever you know, been in a library where the old books are, there's the, the card catalog, every book sits in a certain section, it's been picked by the librarian and it's categorized that way. And he says in the, in the digital age, we can categorize things a hundred different ways, doesn't matter. All the different categorizations may be useful to somebody somewhere sometime, uh, which is a great argument. And then the James Glick book is simply the best book I've ever read. I've read it maybe five times and listened to the audio book maybe 10 times. If you wanna do this work, Wait, you, you, the slides aren't changing? We're on like slide 10 here. Somebody should have told, told me that. Excuse me, sir. The slide is not changing. Well, yeah, I just saw a note in the box, but uh, I don't know why that is. It, sh it should be. Sir, uh, no, please reconnect again. Probably then it will... Yes, sir, now it's showing, sir. Now it is. Well, that would have been good to know. Yes, sir, now it is. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying, just a long time ago, 20 years ago, um, this was, a, I spent most of my time talking about this slide, right, trying to illustrate that the way that I induct method, created these methods grew organically from the data. That's the main point that I wanted to leave you with. And that I started using software called Nudis, Non-Numeric Unstructured Data Index Searching Theory Building, to study this data for these people, these government agencies, right? So that uh, they could better understand public comments. And the slide that I was saying 
this you know was the most important method slide is this one the positive is in being quantitative the purest qualitative and and then what i advocate for being something in the middle uh really very sorry you guys weren't seeing this the whole time i was <laughs> talking about it this is the book i mentioned it's the book by fielding and lee that talks about the importance of finding all the relevant material and i'm trying to link that concept for you to the idea of saturation which is when you've seen enough of something uh you don't need to see anymore and i think we were right up to this slide and i was talking about the jarvis weinberger and glick books and they are all uh, wonderful books uh, in terms of the software that i was using uh, around 2005 it would have been atlas ti which is one of many um, off-the-shelf uh, commercial applications. We actually built some tools because I was collaborating with computer scientists. We built tools that were add-ons to Atlas TI to do some of the things I'm going to show you uh, today or that you could read about in this paper. Uh, uh, someone wants me to go back to the book slide? Sure. This is all, it's all going to be recorded, but yeah, it's what would Google do Jarvis, the information, James Glick, and everything is miscellaneous, David Weinberger. Three great books. Um, and this is a good article, a little old now, but from 2008. And it really lays out what we were thinking about at the time uh, that um, we started building our own software. So this was a paper we published that I think has a nice summary of the pros and cons of using software as we understood them at that time. And uh, so I encourage you to have a look at it. Our original software was open source. So you, uh, uh, Romana, you were right that we were originally an open source software project hosted at a university. It did get shut down because this was very old code. We shut this down in 2020 um we hadn't worked on the code since 2011 it had just been operating in the web uh obviously lots of people use it if you if you google scholar for the exact phrase coding analysis toolkit i think there's four or five hundred academic publications that use this software so this software was the beginning of what became discover text so deep inside of discover text which is a, a much bigger, bigger and elaborate software project is the kernel, which is the coding analysis toolkit. And what makes the coding analysis toolkit important are a number of things. One is, well, they're, they're mostly in the middle of the list here. You know, the ability to assign two or more people to label data or to code data. This was something we had to sort of build workarounds for when we used Atlas TI, it was very clumsy and difficult to store the data and merge the data and do the measurements. So we built these tools just to make it easier to do coding faster at scale. Um, and um, this is basically what became Discover Text. And, you know, more at the theoretical level, but certainly very important if you're starting to think about oh, maybe I want to use software to do qualitative research, is that this has always been uh, really hard. Categories are hard, hard things to use correctly. Uh, they are easy things to make mistakes with. And there's nothing really about software that makes categories easier. Um, what software does allow you to do is, in some cases, manage the problem. Uh, in other cases, uh, you can solve parts of a problem faster and at a bigger scale than you could without software. But you can also make bigger mistakes at scale using software and reach uh, more irregular or false conclusions at scale if you are careless about how you use software. So let me just stop for a second and I'm going to take a drink. I want to ask if anybody in the class has any questions about anything I've said so far. Uh, 
so is this cat usable at all now or it's totally uh, defunct i think that the code is still in sourceforge and you can download the code and if you're a, a very technically able person you could run it but there's no reason to because it's a vastly inferior software to discover text which is free okay. for academics and you can just log into it on the web okay thank you Any other questions? Okay, so should we resume? Yes, sir, we can. And the okay. moment there are certain questions, I will get back to you. Also, Very good. This is an article that I read in 2013. At this point, um, people had been using uh, CAT for about uh, six or seven years, six years, I guess. And we had built Discover Text in 2010. And when I read this article, which is actually a very complex, difficult, and mathematically intensive article, where uh, many of the nuts and bolts of it are really beyond my ability and my skill set, I was able to take away this set of lessons or findings. And what I what I liked about this is this this set of bullet points here. I had learned the hard way. I learned that all of these things are true, but I didn't learn it by reading this great article by Grimmer and Stewart. I learned it because I had spent, you know, the, the period between 2001 and the 2013. Hello? I'm so sorry, sir. There was some disturbance, I think, from somebody said. I, I, I had spent, you know, 12 years of my life trying to do all the things on this list. And I had even built software because, yes, it's hard. If you ask somebody, to label a hundred tweets, they can do that. You can do that in like 10 minutes in Discover Text. But if you ask them to label a thousand, you know, suddenly they're gonna get tired, they don't want money, you know, they, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the people aren't always gonna be equally good at doing this. this, is a really important point. But another really important point on this list is that um, you can't trust any human or any machine without checking to see if the human or the machine is right. And it's in that process of checking to see if people agree into rate of reliability, or if they're making valid observations, if they're correct, that you learn this key idea, which is no matter how good you think your model is, it's always uh, got something, some problem. There's always some problem with every model. I like to make a lot of binary models. It is or isn't this, but sometimes you need a third category. I don't know, can't tell, you know, or maybe you have five categories, you know, four of them are topics and the fifth one is, you know, unsure. It doesn't, you, you never know until you start trying to use your model with your data. Uh, and what we teach people to do is just what they call validate, validate, validate right which is once you start using a model make sure that there's some way to check whether or not it's valid and that will vary purist qualitative researchers will do that differently than mixed methods people and will do that differently than more quantitatively or content analysis oriented people um, another thing that really lit up my imagination along the way is i got to meet professor von hippel he was a keynote speaker at a conference I organized with funding from the National Science Foundation on crowdsourcing. And so at the same time that we were building and testing this software out, we were also thinking about why this is true. Why is it that if you distribute tasks across big groups of people, um, you can do things that are really remarkable. And, you know, along with that came, because we were funded by the National Science Foundation, the prerogative and imperative indeed to measure 
You know, if you ask a human to do something, how fast are they? How reliable, how consistent are they? Are they right or wrong a lot? You know, if you train a machine off this human labeled data, how accurate is the machine? And then of course the $64 million question, which I've never been able to answer is, who in the end can say if the machine is, is right or wrong and who spends the time doing that? It can be almost an infinite loop of validation in some ways. What we built is a piece of software where you know a, a tweet in this case loads to the screen. There's a couple of labels. In this case, one is first person fear. The other is, is the person expressing fear and the other label is not. And to record the op observation, I could use my mouse and click, which you'll see in the demo or I could just hit the number one or the number three. And you could have any number of labels you want. You can uh, make the labels whatever you want them to be. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can be non-mutually exclusive. You could start with no labels and just do inductive, qualitative, and create new labels as you go along. I'll show you that as well. Basically what Discover Text is, is a platform you know, for taking samples from your raw data archives, which I'll show you today, putting your samples into buckets, which are subsets of raw data, and then creating data sets, which are samples that you want to label. So you can see here uh, from a project I was working on, which was you know, how people use fear in American politics um, or how people express fear in American politics. I took many, many samples from many buckets and many archives and did a lot of labeling. Now, a minute ago, I mentioned the concept of inter-rater reliability. For a lot of qualitative researchers, this is taboo, meaning uh, don't talk about it. I don't want to hear about it. It's not relevant to my methodology. I don't believe in it. It's not a real thing. I've heard a lot of uh, people question whether or not you can do a measurement of inter-rater reliability and qual call yourself a qualitative researcher. So just so to explain what that all means is, in this case, I asked four coders, you know, to label some items uh, from Twitter uh, that had the word smoking in them. And the labels were uh, other, tobacco, and weed. And you can see how how many items each coder put in each category. Typically, they would all code the same number of items as a very old, very, very, very old slide. Um, but in this, in this example, they didn't. But this measurement, known as a Fleiss's Kappa, is the measurement of inter-rater reliability. And it's one way to come to grips with the fact that sometimes a coding scheme that you think is easy is actually pretty hard because everybody interprets these labels, other, tobacco, weed, differently. And that's true across all sorts of things. So we built the tool in CAT, in the Coding Analysis Toolkit, which is in Discover Text, that when you have, is in this case, uh, five annotators who have all labeled the same. This is a, a sign a Weibo post. Um, you can see, uh, um, is that the date? Yeah, 2014 sign a Weibo post and we that's one thing we do we do support a lot of languages a lot more than than a lot of other software companies for doing this kind of work so in this case the task for the coder was is it or is it not about mh17 and i don't know if you all know what mh17 it was interestingly just in the news the other day uh, because MH17 is a, is a plane that got shot down. And uh, as is 370, and 777 is a type of plane. So I don't speak uh, uh, simplified Chinese or Mandarin, but um, we had annotators who did. And in this case, four of them said it was about MH17, and one said it wasn't. Now, I don't know if we have any Mandarin speakers on the call, but do you think that this, this, is the, this is the metadata, this is what was being labeled, do you think that this is about MH17? Or 
Romani, do you think it is? No, sir. You don't think it's about MH7? We can't understand. What is that? Abhidushi, so, can you speak a bit louder? Your voice is very faint. So it's it's a it's in a different language. So how we can say it's MS seventeen or N seventy or T S seventeen? Yeah, well, so it is in Mandarin. It's true, um, but it actually has the, the characters M H seventeen are the first four characters, which is the which is the the task is for the human to look at this piece of text and to label it. Is it about MH17, which is a plane that was shot down. A lot of people died. Prior to that, then I think we should understand. We cannot what say it's MH about MH17. We can just say that MH17 has been um, quoted there, but we don't know what 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 is well, describing it. Well, exactly. The I can of MS let me let me simplify for you. I'm sorry to ask you a, com a confusing question. All of these coders were fluent in Mandarin. They're all okay. fluent speakers of English and Mandarin. Four of them looked at this piece of text and said, yes, it's about MH17. One of them, coder 2279, looked at this piece of text and pushed the button, not MH17. So the whether or not it's about MH17 or not, it is, uh, is, is irrelevant. The point from a methods point of view is that you have a high degree of agreement and one annotator who disagrees. And from the point of view of what our software so it's is It's possible for, that the one annotator has interpreted it in a, at a deeper level probably, and that's why he says it's not about MH17. Right. Deep, deeper is probably a generous. I mean, the, this plane was shot down. This plane was shot down. This is a type of airplane. This is about shoot, shooting down airplanes, right? Uh, the, the task was, is this about the shoot down of this airplane? And the answer is yes. In qualitative research, it's not always clear. In this task, it wasn't, we weren't really asking the annotators to search for deeper meaning, right? We're asking them to create a, a binary observation. Is it or is it not? And the reason we do this is because sometimes there are a series of characters in a data set that uh, we would expect to mean one thing, but they mean something else. And I'll say more about that. But finding relevant data is a big part of what we do. Taking a step back, part, part of what the software does is it looks at coders like that when they work in groups and allows us to rank them over time. I won't get deep into the nuts and bolts of, 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 a, of a machine learning patent, but the basic idea is that if you had 10 people in a room labeling your data, they're not all equal. They're not all equally familiar with the data. They're not all equally familiar with the concepts. They don't equally interpret um, the task. And so here is an example of what happens over time. If you look at, as we did in that, go back for a second. In this case, we would have said, no, 2279 is wrong, not valid. And we would have said, yes, 5611, 0043, 5981, and 9783 are all right. So these coders would all get a plus one. This coder would get a minus one. That's what coder rank is based on. And over time, we can see that, you know, depending on how hard it is, very good coders make a lot of mistakes, right? Like these are exceptional coders. I have a question here. Uh, yeah. Can you please go back to the previous uh, slide? Now, you see, even, not this one, the where you had all the five coders together. Now, who yeah. is the one who made the judgment? Finally, uh, there was a master coder in that manner? Yes, there's a ma there's a, either a master coder or a group. I had, uh, I had fluid uh, Mandarin speaking graduate students at the time, so they were able okay. to 
to to make the resolution. Okay. The, the point the point is that these kinds of uh, disagreements actually come up all the time in companies like Facebook when they have to do content moderation uh, and Twitter and Instagram and other places where people are doing threats and suicide um, posts and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, a big part of what you're about to see in the software is how you can take these human coded items, turn them into machine learning models and use them to clean up in this case, the Twitter data. So in this example, we were labeling tweets that had the word flyers, which is the name of a hockey team. But there's a lot of tweets about flyers that aren't about hockey, that are about you know, airplane flyers or high flyers or other, thing, other things like that. And so we, we're often doing this kind of work. I mentioned this example earlier. If we want to study cigarette smoking, we might have to make a model of all the ways that people talk about cigarettes so that we can s separate it from smoking cannabis or smoking hot, I'm uh, sorry, smoking barbecue. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, when we were doing this big, you know, National Cancer Institute funded project, there was a lot of uh, smoking hot w boys and smoking hot girls. That was all pornography that was in the day. So we had to come up with a way to know when people were talking about actually cigarettes so that we can clean out all the other data. The same thing happens if you study like a brand, like Avon, the company for women, we had towns that were Avon, we had uh, a TV character called Avon Barksdale, and we had uh, a lot of fans of Justin Bieber, who when he was a young boy would go sit on the steps of the Avon theater. So if we wanted to, to study this, and we collected all the mentions of Avon, we had to, to build a way to clean up the data same thing in politics and sports we have a very popular football team called the patriots we have a lot of political talk uh, about patriots so if you want to study one you have to get rid of all the mentions of the other so essentially what are tools that i'm about to show you contribute to uh, this field is a way to do all of this on the web so when in the old days we would download or actually we would get cds we would install software on computers. So all of our software was born on the web. It's always lived on the web. And there's something fundamentally different about software that is born on the web versus software that was originally built to be installed on a desktop computer. Uh, because if it's born on the web, you can inscribe the properties of the internet into the software, which is what we did. Um, some of the tools I tried to explain, um, I think it got a little convoluted there with the, with the Mandarin example, um, is that our tools were built out of collaboration with computer scientists, statisticians, uh, math professors, sociologists, political theorists, and me, who is a you know, historian. So the tools represent a hybrid of a lot of different ways of thinking about what you can do with data. It, it's not, you know, it's, it's, like I said, pluralist. It's neither quantitative nor qualitative. You can do very, very solid qualitative research with these tools and never touch any of the more advanced uh, functionality related to machine learning. So I want to be clear about that. I, you know, I, my roots are in traditional inductive grounded theory, the kind that I did with those old crumbling newspapers with those books I just happened to have a life journey that caused me to uh, hang out with computer scientists and become friends with them and so we ended up building all this stuff so um, I'll take a, a couple of questions and then switch over to do a live demo um, of the software do, do people have questions that they'd like to ask Uh, one question that I wanted to ask you is, you said that uh, the software is, uh, you know, you can use it to many languages. Do these languages include even Indian ones also, sir? Well, we are about to find out in the live demo. I certainly hope so. We did, I, I, we did uh, ask users at one point and we documented use cases in more than 30 languages, including the top 10 most spoken on earth. So I think Indian is one of them. So. I think it was probably in the group, but we're about to find out. So okay. stay, stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 
You're going to have to give me some uh, queries in the chat box that we can test on Twitter. Uh, uh, other other questions like that. It's a great question, by the way. Yes, uh, Dr. Shulman, there are a lot of um, softwares in the market. Uh, how does your software really stand apart, or how is it really different? Is it only in terms of the AI that's using for the text analysis? Well, I think you'll have to judge for yourself if you've used any of the others. Um, I think one of the fundamental um, dividing lines was this idea that it was born on the web, right? And that it was born with the idea of collaboration in mind, and it was born with the idea of measurement in mind. So it's, a, it's very much a scientific research instrument that was built by a qualitative historian who was getting a lot of funding from the National Science Foundation. So we had to do things that scientists across the discipline would recognize as science. And, and qualitative research doesn't always pass that muster because a lot of qualitative researchers say and have said to me, uh, for example, I don't believe in inter-rater reliability or any of these measurements because I'm an expert in what I study and nobody else knows my area the way I do. And my interpretation of the data is entirely unique and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a fine argument. You're just not gonna get any scientific funding if you make that argument. And to add on to whatever you have said, sir, I feel that, um, uh, you know, as I was going through uh, this particular slide, as well as the earlier one, that it's not only AI that you're looking for, it's more of big data that is also involved into it because you are talking about clustering algorithms, machine learning, classifiers. So obviously, uh, this gives the basic foundation for the big data analysis also side by side. And uh, for me, the question arises, so are you uh, here introducing even testing the data and training the data also for the qualitative data for me? Is yeah, we do. Uh, we can do uh, in real time. We can we can do a demonstration of how you create training data for machine learning. It takes five minutes in Discover Text. Okay, all right. So this goes even for the image analysis or video analysis without any uh, problem of the size that I'm going to take care for those uh, images or the movies or the pictures. Well, uh, I haven't said anything about studying images or videos. Okay. Uh, sorry, my dog just came up, so you may hear her in the background. Um, this is, I mean, you'll, you will see images and videos that show up in tweets, but you're not going to be uploading um, images or videos to discover text because it's a text analysis software. Okay. So you can't. So uh, this goes for, and it is true for the narrative, discursive, uh, displacement, all those things also, right? Well, uh, again, you're going to see it was built for something in, in particular, which is large numbers, meaning thousands, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of uh, digital objects, units of text, whether they're public comments to federal government agencies, or tweets, we used to get Facebook posts. We very commonly work with the open-ended answers on surveys, emails, anything that is um, about a paragraph or less. So discursive analysis, uh, interviews, focus groups, there are other software for that. That's not really what Discover Text is for. Okay. Discover Text is for medium data, not big data. Media big data is tens of millions or hundreds of millions or billions of units. We specialize on between a thousand and a million, which is medium data. Right, so, so there they is, need, uh, I'm so sorry, please. They need to be structured, right? They need to be structured in some way. Does that make sense? Yes, it's not sir. just, it's just not like if I think of an interview, it can go anywhere, it has no structure or focus group. Yeah, and you have to highlight bits and pieces of data uh, that um, 
you know, exist within a, a longer range of unstructured text. As you're about to see in this platform, and I'm going to share a tab now, which is Discover Text, um, the, all of the value of the tools that we built depends on the data coming in um, being um, structured in some way. So if somebody uh, would like to suggest a popular but non-controversial topic in the chat window, uh, using an Indian term or Indian terms. Um, we could do a demo project. I'm assuming you can now see Discover Text on your screen. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, before that, sir, I have two more questions here. Oh, can sure. I quickly take it up? Now, of one course. question that has come up from one of the participants is, how does software capture tone and sentiments of tweets? Yeah, we're going to come. We're going to come to that. You got to kind of a couple steps ahead of us. Uh, okay. uh, again, uh, software doesn't do anything that the human can't do. I mean, it does some things that don't require judgment. But if it comes to something that requires a judgment, there's no software that makes human judgments out there. There's just a framework for creating and recording judgments, you know, with within whatever those categories are you want to study so i know a lot of companies and other people claim to do sentiment analysis and they take a algorithm off the shelf that's been trained you know on consumer data or something like that and they try to apply it to their domain and they're like huh well it works sometimes it doesn't work the other time and oh it turns out 80 to 90 percent of my data has no sentiment at all so actually what you need to do to do sentiment analysis is first determine whether or not any exists in your data. And then you need to break it all down into the data that has sentiment, the data that doesn't. And then you need to build a model about your specific data for, uh, that has or has not got uh, sentiment into the categories that you choose. So for example, um, a common thing in com uh, commercial uh, research is how do customers feel about the price or the service? So I'm gonna build a model of how customers feel about the price of a product or the service provided by an organization. Those are two different models because the way you talk about if you're happy or sad with the price is different than how you talk about whether you're happy or sad or satisfied or not with service. They're not the same lexicons. And a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that there's some sort of magic button out there that you can push and put things into categories. That The whole point of my lecture is no, categories are really hard. Plato said that they would be frustrating and he was right. Uh, and when you try and do that, that's when you learn just how hard it is. So we'll come to the topic of um, tone and sentiment, but you'll see it's the thing you usually come to last in this research, not first, because you have to work your way up to it. You first have to get the data. Then you have to determine whether the data is relevant. And then within the relevant data, you again, have to determine whether it has sentiment or not. So you have many steps before you get to, um, you know, is there tone or sentiment? Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, this is, is the software ID for narrative analysis or discourse analysis? or for other types of qualitative analysis. Well, you're, you're going to have to tell me after you, after you see the demo. As I said, it's not built for every single type of qualitative data. And when I see narrative analysis or discourse analysis, I think of certain types of data, not necessarily what we're going to focus on today, which is Twitter or the other ones I mentioned, open-ended answers on surveys or other bodies of data that are structured, unstructured text. Yes, sir. So those were the two questions that I could uh, see that has come up on the chat box. Right. Very good. I'm going to start a new project so you can see some software. Okay. Nobody has put an Indian word or phrase that is non-controversial in the chat box yet. Can somebody do that? Um, or we could just do cricket in English if you like. Yes, or how about, the, how about the Indian word for cricket? What is it? 
Somebody put it in the chat box. Oh, cricket. Nobody is too naive for this software. This software could be used by children, and it has been. I have high school students. I have high school students who use the software. Can someone just put the Indian word in for cricket in the chat box? We use basically cricket only, sir, in India. Oh, okay. I, well, is there some related word in Indian that would go in to show someone wanted to see whether Indian would work? <laughs> I get. Okay. Is that a that's an exact phrase? Oh my God, Gulli Danda is totally different, Kunjal. <laughs> but hey, uh, it's uh, it's um, there is uh, some phrase for cricket. Let me let me tell you just a minute. It's no no huh? no no. It's lamb dand goal pind dhar pakar pratiyogita. Oh my God, Abhidushi, <laughs> that would be a very long word for sir. All right, let's just, just... do cricket. Let's do cricket. No, I'm I'm putting this in chat box. So you asked us. So I'm putting this in the chat box. See, this is like this. This is in English. She has written lamb dand gol pind dhar pakad pratiyogita. Pratiyogita. Is, is that an exact phrase? Yes, yes. For cricket, it is used in Hindi. Okay. Well, we'll try it. We'll try it. I'm just going to call the project now cricket. Okay. So think of this. What you see on the screen now as uh, like um, the new PowerPoint file, a new Word file, a new SPSS file. It's just a new project. All it has is a name, Cricket. There's a big button over here. Right. Sir. Somebody, somebody wrote that this is, that the software is too hard. No, it isn't. It's very easy. Watch. <laughs> Only a few steps. So one, click the button. Two, you need to have to do Twitter, Twitter account, but you can upload a spreadsheet or a text file, if you just, like say you have interviews, as long as you have a blank line between every passage of text, you can upload that to discover text. So there's a lot of ways to bring data in, but we're gonna look at the Twitter way today. And basically this is just using a Twitter credential to open up a pathway directly to Twitter which a lot of people do. Can't we analyze the comments of YouTube? Uh, that's a separate matter. Uh, we don't have a YouTube uh, collector anymore. If you can get them in a spreadsheet, you can analyze them. Anything that you can get in a spreadsheet, you can analyze and discover text. Right? So if you can get all the comments, YouTube does not make it easy to get the comments. Twitter makes it easy to get tweets. That's the difference. Anyway, I'm going to call this. Uh, oh no! I'm going to call this cricket as is well. There this any, right. Is there any limitation for the tweets to be uploaded here, or we can um, add as many as we want? There'll be a limit. Okay. Your limit won't be as big as my limit. Uh, you know, it, it, it costs me money. The big, the more you store, the more money it costs me. Okay. So, uh, we, we limit it. Yes. But you can get more than you need. So this is step two. Step one, I just named a folder where it's going to go. I called it cricket. And step two, I'm going to say cricket or the Boolean order operator. And then I'm going to put the exact phrase in quotes so basically i'm going to go to twitter and say i either want cricket or something i will generously not try to pronounce okay so i'm asking for either either one and on the third step you see anyone can do this uh you set the rate if you go once a day it's probably fine if you go once an hour, you're going to get a lot of data very quickly. It's up to you. If you go too often, they'll limit you. So it starts, and uh, as data comes in, you'll see the number here change. And this is the name of our archive here. I want to start looking at some of the data. Oh. Right. 
Here we go. The default size of this list is 25, but you can actually make it quite long, which can be very useful. So, I don't know if that phrase is in the data, but I bet Cricket is. How is this? How are these character displays? Are these good? Yes, sir. They're readable. It's accurate. So you can see this data is coming in in uh, in real time. Some of it is a mix of languages, right? Or people seem to always hashtag in English for some reason. Um, so what will happen is over a period of time, more and more data will come in. And so this is the first part of the project is the raw data collection. Now, you could have uploaded a spreadsheet. There's a video in the in the video section off the home page. It's two minutes. It shows you how to structure a spreadsheet to upload uh, data. One of the reasons we really like Twitter a lot is because it's very structured, even though it's unstructured data, right? It has all these um, interesting properties. If I open a single tweet, somebody asked about images and video. Well, with Twitter, you do get the images in Discover Text, right? And you also have these very structured metadata fields. So this is all the information about this tweet. Um, is this going to capture YouTube data also? As I said before, if you can capture YouTube data, okay. you can upload that data here, not videos, but the mm -hmm. comments. Okay. But we don't have access because they're very restrictive, unlike Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is not. Anyway, one of the advantages of studying, as you can see, uh, uh, Twitter data in Discover Text is that we, in fact, use this Twitter display. And so that means when you're looking at Twitter data in Discover Text, you're looking at it live on Twitter, uh, which uh, is, is quite valuable for a variety of reasons, including if you're studying engagement. Um, this data, as you see, is getting bigger. It comes from a very short period of time. 241 to uh, 326, so what, uh, less than an hour. This is Greenwich Mean Time. Um, so if we left this going for a day or a week, I'd probably have hundreds of thousands of tweets um, to study. Some of the other ways we study Twitter data, some people are interested in hashtags, users, user descriptions, user locations, and say something about all that. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, a lot of power in this system to plow through metadata. Um, these are the user accounts that sent, sent the tweets. You could download the whole list. These are the top hashtags, the top 10. You could download the whole list. Sometimes when I'm doing research, I look at what the hashtags are that show up from the first query, and then I go back and change my query, see the, the locations. Not every Twitter user gives a location. And I spend a lot of time studying uh, user descriptions. I actually think they're more interesting than tweets. Uh, so those are some, some features of the data that you can study using Discover Text, which we would call metadata. There's this feature here that looks for exact duplicates in the collection. And here, that's definitely a, a byproduct of, of working with computer scientists is that, and this, this was built for a completely different reason. We've done in a second, because this is still pretty, even at 2200, this is considered a, a, small, a small project for us, but this was built for sorting public comments on proposed regulations. Sometimes we get a lot of form letter campaigns to government, which are really just ways that groups raise money by kicking up a fuss. 
and uh, you know, getting, getting donations. Here we go. But this is the, an example of these like the most viral tweets so far. Based on the first 2100, there are 64 retweets of this tweet. It's the most viral one, the next most viral one, so on. 49, 47, 41. A day from now, some of these groups will be quite big. You know, there'll be ones that have been retweeted a, a hundred or a thousand or even 10,000 times if they're uh, by a popular person. Uh, any questions about what you've been seeing so far on the screen? This is a nice little feature. Uh, can I uh, collect the data, let's say on hourly basis, so that in uh, future I can do the comparisons also in this? Or uh, it has to be that, yes, the flow would be there, and then, um, you know, I need to segregate it. So when I set up this one, that, that first procedure, mm -hmm. when I set this uh, fetch up, I said it was going to go once an hour, a hundred times. So an hour from now, it's going to go back to Twitter and ask for more data. Okay. And then in another hour, it's going to ask for more data. And in another hour, it's going to ask for more data. So that's the way it's set up right now. Right. Uh, so it is but you can also do it once a day or once every 12 hours. You can do it every 15 minutes if you want, but Twitter may limit you and shut okay. you off. Right. So. Does that answer your question? I think you can proceed further, so. Okay. So as you can see, we're over 3,000 tweets now. These are all the metadata fields that are available from Twitter through this source. So if I was interested in something like who are, you know, who are the most influential Twitter users in this collection, I could sort this list and see there are some very probably journalistic. These are very high scores. I'll show you what they mean in a minute. But uh, so say influence score greater than a certain value. 10,000. What that means is we're only going to look at accounts, tweets from accounts that have 10,000 times as many followers as they follow. So this one is... Uh, Got a very high influence score. Like, what is that? 1.4 million followers? <laughs> oh, it's the official Twitter account of the International Cricket Council. That makes sense. Right. Uh, here's a news outlet. And these scores are really high. Biggest paper, biggest newspaper, India's biggest Hindi new newspaper. Like, I actually never really study um sources with an influence score that high but one thing i do a lot is look at ones uh i might say influence score greater than or equal to or sorry less than or equal to five let's make it even smaller three push for that it's gonna be a much bigger list this is three thousand three hundred we have a button up here called add all to new bucket. So this is cricket influence less than three. And I wanted you to see that operation because it's one of the really fundamental things you can do in discover text is create buckets. And that was a very simple one is I want to look at accounts that have influence score that's less than three. And then I might even filter it further and say again influence score uh, greater than or equal to one so now i've got two filters really in place and i'm down to 800 accounts but they might be really interesting they've got a score between one and three you know so this is a small account 96 followers Here's an interesting account, not 87,000 followers. Um, my point is that there's 
almost no limit to the number of ways that you can um, take raw data in Discover Text and use the tool, the tools that we've built uh, to find things that you're interested in, things that you want to study. And it will depend. You know, not all data is structured as nicely as Twitter data. Right? The nice thing about Twitter data is the tweets have a maximum length. All the metadata is very structured. It means we can do things, you know, with that data that we can't do with an interview or a focus group because of that structure. And one of those things is you know, take things like these are the tweets that have cricket in the in the tweet text itself. Sometimes it might appear in the metadata, not in the text, and that's why it's in the archive. So this would this is basically just a way of using a search cricket in tweet text to make a smaller pile. And then I may have some other features of this data that I'm interested in. Like, for example, I might want to code it for whether or not it's English or not. And I happen to have uh, a global classifier, a personal classifier, which you, you can have your own or use the global one, become your own. And this is, well, a couple of interesting things here. One is, Although we just collected this data, one of the data points we collected has already been deleted. And um, from the point of view of academic research, this makes our platform more compliant with institutional review boards and funding agencies, and especially with Twitter, because you're not allowed to look at deleted tweets. And so we check automatically. And so if it's deleted, you won't see it. Right, sir. So there is a question at this moment also, uh, and it is, can we filter the data that comes from a particular location? Yes. Uh, remind me of that question when I can finish what I'm showing you right now. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. So this is coding, right? Uh, this is the default style. The categories are mutually exclusive. The codes are linked to numbers on the keypad or letters. <coughs> Excuse me. Is see this is mixed, and this is a great example, right? I only have two codes, so which one should I use? It's, it's English, but it's also not English. Uh, so in fact, I wouldn't even really want to code this one. I'd probably skip it. Um, So you can have, as I said, more codes. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. If they're non-mutually exclusive, you won't have buttons. You'll have checkboxes. So you can label things as having two or three or four uh, properties um, and so on. So that's coding. You can see I just coded nine. This is machine learning, where I take those nine and I add them to any ones that I've had before any training data that I've used before. And it's now going to go through this whole data set. You can see it's processing down here. And it's going to put a score on every item. And what that score is going to do is predict the likelihood that the item is English. And this is just a good example of how machine learning works. So like they're, they're uh, mostly English. There's a very small number that are, are likely not English. Um, which is why I wanted to do a, let's see, not English. This is how you would use a machine learning score as a filter. These ones should be largely not English. Oh, these ones are English. But it's confusing because it doesn't look like normal English, right? So these ones I can actually code as English. There's a great filter here I really like called items not coded. You add that, uh, items will drop off the list once they've been coded. So this looks like English also. 
Um, but most of these are, are right. I think it's safe to say. Some are mixed, those are trickier. But this is just an example of doing language prediction with some new data. This is an example of a like a where I would want to refine the classifier. This is actually not my most mature. This is just a demo classifier. Um, we can actually change this filter. English equals. We just wanted to see the ones that were most likely to be English. I can in fact run my eyes over this list, code 100. Sorry. And this is a method that can be used for a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of ways to use this functionality of what I call coding off a list to code hundreds or thousands of items per hour. Um, and it doesn't work for everything. It works best with binaries. I really like binaries. Um, but this, some of these features for, um, for coding, so these are the ones that are least likely to be English. And they mostly, I think that's fine. I just code all these. The thing is, when you're coding bulk coding like this, which I know is probably shocking to a purist qualitative researcher, uh, but it's it's good. It's really valuable. I just you know, while, while we're talking, I just coded almost 300 items, and then I can go back and rebuild my machine learning model. And that's why we call it sort of humans and machines learning together, um, because you know it, it could be something like you know, is it tobacco or not? Is it, um, you know, is it, when they say football, are they talking about soccer or are they talking about American football? You know, sometimes you go, you go into the internet and you're looking for something. And we've got 6,600 tweets here on cricket. I'm going to shut that off. Probably enough, enough tweets for this demo. Um, and sometimes you find things that you weren't looking for. And another thing I would say about the things that I'm showing you, right, raw data archives, buckets that are samples, data sets that are for labeling. Like, let me show you another workflow that can be very useful. Back when we had 2100, I could take a sample out of this feature, create a new bucket, and what that bucket is going to have is one item from all of these 150 groups and all of the one item, all of the items that aren't. So seeds, one item from every group, the seeds and the single items. That's a purposive sample, right? And if I wanted to uh, open code it, inductive grounded theory, no machine learning, no buttons. You know, I can take a random sample here, 500 items out of my bucket. Um, I have a really nice feature here, which allows you to go back and sample out only items that aren't in other data sets. So you can iterate and get fresh data every time you do. And then I'm, I'm not gonna hit any of these buttons, but I am gonna check this one and this one. User-defined codes, which is the grounded theory. And then the ability to select more than one code. I'm going to create that data set. Hit finished. Now, instead of having buttons, I have this panel on the right. And uh, I can code this as uh, well, obviously pride. And if I wanted to put a second code, there's a on, a, on my keyboard, it's the backslash key with a shift down. It's called a pipe. It's that straight up and down line. I could say pride and rankings, and then either hit the button or hit enter. And then that previous item was labeled with these two codes, pride and ranking, and it shows up on my list. And then the new item loads, 
Uh, no, I would put it. I don't know. Local national. Just making up codes. Obviously, codes can be anything you want. And uh, a really nice um, feature of this software is that if you were doing this in a group, um, you could work together on a data set like this. And what would load on your screen is the next thing that nobody has coded. And as you build these codes iteratively using grounded theory, um, when other people create a new code, you know, uh, it shows up on your list in real time. And I've seen this produce some pretty amazing results, like a group of 10 people working simultaneously because once it's on you know oh interesting this is really great applying data science and machine learning to the game of cricket i think i would like that um the data Any questions about this particular style of coding obviously once it's on the list you know you can code right off the list it's a nice a nice feature. This is the closest to traditional qualitative software we get. But I actually think it's better. Okay, so you had a question about location. Uh, let me go back to the data archive. Bring up the list. Move that. So as I said, not everybody gives a location in their Twitter profile. You know, this could be the one one user who did 386 tweets, and it could be 386 users who gave India. But these are, you know, you can page through them. And if you wanted to, to filter, to just see the ones from a particular location. You know, here's the 23 that have given Karachi. There it is. It's up to the user to decide what they call their location. Some, some people call the locations pretty weird stuff. Um, but does that answer your question? A lot, of, a lot of people do not give locations. Point is, uh, point is, when we report the data, how will we show the locations then? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you say the question again? When we do the analysis and we report about the data, about the locations, how will we report it? Then we have to make this table only, right? Well, I don't fully understand your question because um, you can report data any way you want. It's up to you. Um, mm -hmm. This table is one way to see it quickly and to use it to filter within the software. But no feature of software is a research finding or a result. It's just a software feature. So how you use that information is really up to you. You can report it any way you want. Like one thing might be, for example, uh, um, through this other window, the top meta explorer, we can go to the location, right? We can bring up the top 10, but then we can also download the spreadsheet of all the locations. Right? That's what I'm saying. Do we have yeah. to download the spreadsheet and then we make the table on that, right? Uh, it's up to you. There's not a right, there's not a right way to do it, but this is the place in the software if you wanted to download the locations. But again, uh, sometimes it's fewer than 10% or 5% of all the users give location. So it's not representative of your data. It's just representative of people who, when they use Twitter, have given a location. And many, many, many people don't. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. So we can make a word cloud also of this, all the tweets? 
Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, here, there's a feature called the Cloud Explorer. I don't really like the cloud. It is still called a word. It was a word cloud originally. Uh, I think it's not that useful analytically. And I think it makes really dumb PowerPoint slides uh, because it doesn't really tell anybody anything. Uh, another thing, so we give the list and the term frequency, which will come up in a second when it's done. Um, but I don't recommend standing in front of a scholarly audience and putting up a word cloud ever. It, it really, nobody likes it. Uh, but these are the most common terms in a table. And these are the most common uh, bigrams, two word com combinations. Mm -hmm. So you might want to use this uh, in trigrams, not as a result, but as a way to explore the data and think about things that might be useful next step. Like, for example, like I see a lot of people come to a research conference and call this a result. It's not a result. It's not really anything, right? So it's really just, uh, if you're gonna use term frequencies, first of all, get rid of your duplicates the way I did to make this bucket of seeds and singles. Second, you know, be clear that, you know, what you're looking at is uh, not a result, but maybe just an entry point to look at some data and then formulate a question. And then once you formulate your question, then you still have to do the research. The number of times a word appears is not a result. It's also not a finding. It's also not a research method. You. Any other questions? I think that's probably a good a good place to leave because we've been going for a while and I don't want to overload people. I will say that if you go uh, to the homepage of DiscoverText, discovertext.com, there are a number of resources. One is there's the link called mentions. And if you go to that link, you'll see a very long list of scholarly articles that mention discover text. Most of them use discover text. So you may learn some interesting methods by looking through this list of papers and maybe seeing some of the ways that people have used discover text before. I always tell people that there is no correct way to use the software. There's not a right first step. Um, the main thing is to avoid shortcuts and to do the work and then be able to defend your results. The second, there's quite a few videos, right? So uh, you can watch any of these videos and, and learn things about how to do some of the things I've shown you today, and they're short and they're important. And uh, I encourage you, you know, to, to take a look at them. Uh, thirdly, there's a link here for the free trial. It says seven day, but if you put in the notes that you were in the class today, I'll send you a license for a full year uh, and you can go for it. Right, it's uh, it's basically I'm, I'm sponsoring your work, and I'm supporting you. And uh, thank you, so. If you if you succeed, I I hope you will remember and mention it uh, to to people. It's also nice when people talk about um, the software and the trainings that we give on social media as a way of spreading the word. Excellent, sir. Any other questions? I Over think we should, we should, we are new to this. We should learn it, practice it, and then come back to you. That will, I think so. I think that would be very fine to have a follow-up meeting mm -hmm. after some practice. That's how it usually works. 
that can also be done. There's a link here called support. And uh, there's the ability to book a, a private meeting with me uh, six days a week. So I encourage you to sign up, mention that you were in the class today, and then do some experimentation, as the gentleman said, and then book a private meeting to follow up about your project. Right. Uh, so there is one question which has come up. Can we create dendrograms? I have no idea what that is. Okay. It is basically the um, networking um, kind of uh, map that we get for the codes. <sighs> no. No, that's not really what we do. That's uh, that's a different style of coding. The kind of networks that we do uh, involve a, a programming language called GraphML, and they map networks of users on Twitter and how uh, how they're linked together. And that you can do uh, with exports from Discover Text. Right, so. So one more question that I wanted to ask you is that since you had already showcased us that yes, mixed methodologies are also available, I will really appreciate it if you uh, very uh, quickly can show us, um, you know, once we have generated the codes and everything, how we can, um, you know, associate these codings to the number, the quantifying side of it also, sir, through this particular software. Uh so um let's see there are various ways to um to see the results of your coding or to like display the results of your your coding uh also to um export the results of your coding uh so can't really cover all of it uh today but you know they're in there and uh, the nice thing about discover text is that you can't break it so uh you know what i what i suggest you do is if you want to try and learn something push the buttons and see what happens okay and uh yeah. if you don't get what you want then that'll be what we talk about in the next meeting sure so definitely. but it's uh it's almost a million lines of software code and it's a very advanced technological creation that does a lot of things. I couldn't possibly show you everything in one day. Oh, no worries, no sir. Way. We will no get way. back to you. Certainly, we will be get back to you, sir. Uh, finally, I would like to thank you for giving us some of your valuable time, sir. And it was uh, really, um, we are all very lucky, I should say, that yes, today we had a chance to um, get a glimpse of discovered text you know, and uh, understand the importance of it. And as you have showed, uh, first of all, I would like to say that, yes, uh, this particular software is able to show us the philosophical assumptions very clearly, the category categorization that you have said, the philosophy behind that, you are able to show it to me very clearly, not just for the interpretivist or the positivist, including the um i would say uh the pluralist now i don't see anybody else uh, talking about it in that manner given the uh rich uh, analysis for the text that we are talking about it does corporate a lot of it especially and uh, i would say uh the rest of the software that was what my observation is till date um you know they uh do not work on the true uh, structure of the big data that we are looking for uh, you know machine learning now i can see that the value and i really appreciate it also that yes uh, going forward how uh, nicely we can use this particular software for our qualitative analysis in hope of it looking at the twitter data or just an investment of little bit of money uh, maybe you can correct me out here we are able to retrieve the data also from twitter and uh, as you said that yes you can work more on the text side of the uh, 
uh, analysis that you are looking for. So I think this is a sophisticated and a beautiful way to proceed further with the text analysis with AI in future also, sir. Not only now, hey, I think that's a very, a very nice summary. And I'm very happy um, to close it out that way. I, I think you've been a very patient group and you've listened to me talk for a very long time. Yes, and, sir. Uh, and uh, we will uh, definitely keep you in loop for future also and see where exactly uh, this particular group is uh, going forward from here. Yes, well, okay. well, very good then. And uh, as I said uh, previously, that the, um, the best way to show your thanks is simply to tell other academics that you know about what we do and how we do it because I do think it is unique. And I don't, I don't really think that there uh, is anything else quite like it. Yes, absolutely right, sir. So I thank you uh, very much at this moment. And I appreciate you giving us some of your valuable time, sir. With this, we uh, uh, like to close this session and uh, coming again to you, requesting you to give us more advanced information about this also. Till the time, uh, you know, we will lay our hands on uh, discover text and try to incorporate into our analysis also, sir. Okay, Thank you, can... sir. Thanks a lot, sir. And have a yeah. wonderful day today, sir. You're very welcome. I look forward to hearing from you. You can lay your hands on it today if you like. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir. Bye. So I think uh, today, uh, we, Renuva, you have joined very late today. Um, by the end of the session, you are joining up, but that's okay. We do have the recording and you can always see the recording also. I will be sharing it. So I think uh, in this way, we have seen another uh, software, which is uh, talking about big data analysis, which uh, none of uh, others, uh, other software uh, talked about it. And here we can clearly see the way he is moving ahead right at the beginning. Only I was able to capture the information, uh, you know, when he uh, introduced it at machine learning. So, you know, qualitative data uh, through machine learning, this is a very good uh, kickoff for all of us to understand that, and especially from the uh, text uh, analysis, basically. And here he has showcased uh, for the Twitter, and he said that we can work. So many of you who keep questioning in the data analysis training group that, you know, uh, which software should we use to go ahead and look at it. Now we have got the answer for that. And I think uh, it's not just me today. I'm going to put that as the answer so that, uh, you know, they can go ahead and they can have a look at it. So all of you are very lucky. So you can grab that opportunity that he has given to you. Go ahead, try version. And in that box, you can say, that yes, we attended this particular thing. And he said that you can use uh, the licensed version for one year. So wish you best of luck, all of you. And I think we should uh, start using them. Uh, and with MaxQDA, <clears throat> uh, you know, when I send the sheet uh, immediately, uh, yes, the software uses uh, MapReduce. Oh, yes, we can. You see, uh, all these uh, individuals, the masters and the experts who are coming in, uh, we should understand that they will not give away everything in one go, you know, small, small pieces. Then they want us to go forward, learn about them, come back to them and understand. Because you see, that's a collaborative work. That's the philosophy of the uh, training sessions that we have got right now. It's not that everything can be learned in two hours. Uh, and you see, these people have invested around 23, 24, and that's why you can see that they have been able to uh, come up, design such wonderful things which are there for us. So I think uh, all of you can grab that opportunity. And with respect to MaxQDA, uh, when I send the directly your details to them, uh, in fact, they have the details, they found that uh, some of us uh, have not given us the complete information. Try to understand they are giving you the licensed version. So they would like to see the names of your universities, uh, the departments that you come in, your phone numbers, your contact numbers, each and everything. So I think I was not able to capture for all 50 of them. Now, if you would tell me, the, okay, ma'am, it's okay, you can take for 35 and remaining 15, then, uh, you know, it does not look good on my part. So, you know, I have sent the information uh, in the group that kindly fill up your 
um, Google Forms as soon as possible. Some of you, may, I don't know what is the reason. The uh, spaces that has been given to us is very clear. University, WhatsApp number, and I think only seven or eight. So I don't see uh, why we should leave those uh, spaces empty or give them a wrong information. So I would appreciate if you all of you can go ahead, look at it, that yes, you have filled in properly, it's well and good. If not, then I'll have to pinpoint it. So I'm expecting them to give it away either this Saturday or Monday. Uh, so that for one month, at least you can use MaxQDA. Uh, fully. Otherwise, I'm extending next week also for this particular workshop so that, uh, you know, I might be able to complete with the rest of the topics also. So tomorrow uh, is Friday level from three to five. We have a master session on Buddhism and one should understand the uh, basic principles and what exactly it is. So here I got the date from, uh, again, he's the right hand of Dalai Lama Ji. Maybe in future, I would be able to invite Dalai Lama, uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama sir, so that uh, we are able to understand what exactly is uh, Buddhism when it comes to, uh, let's say, our research or uh, the departments that we belong to, because he is aware of it. Uh, I shared the entire information with them. So tomorrow, um, Desha, who is the director of the Tibet House, he is joining us up and uh, tomorrow three to five. So I would expect some of you to join him up at three to five. And again, in the evening from eight uh, tomorrow, is, yes, from 9.30, I think. So he is joining us up for another master class. So tomorrow we have got two master classes. So kindly join us up at the same time. Okay, okay one from three o'clock to five o'clock. Um, in the afternoon and one of the the second one is in the evening and I think I have to send you the link for the uh, one which introduces uh, you know Buddhism to all of us. So maybe morning time is the class uh, college time is there college are open now no? three to five uh, is difficult. Ashutosh sir I requested Gesha sir however because he's a senior person again they do not uh, interact uh, with anybody after seven o'clock in the evening. So, you know, he, his time was only three to five. And that's why tomorrow I have kept it open uh, to public also so that uh, he does not mind actually that yes, only 10, 15 people are there. So some of you who are free from three to five, please join us up. And uh, there are a lot of other uh, people also who are joining up from their side. And I'm inviting others also uh, to join us up. So tomorrow, three to five, and again in the evening also. Evening one, I have already sent the link for afternoon one. I'll be sending it in another 45 minutes from now. All right. So thank you. And I will be seeing all of you again tomorrow. Take care. Good night. Bye.